So what they found was that some of the gadolinium that we're administering to our patients is staying in the body, in different places in the body, for weeks, months, maybe years. An extremely, extremely small amount, but it's not zero. Every single gadolinium-based contrast agent seems to leave something in the body. There's a lot of discussion about the structure of the agent, macrocyclic versus linear, ionic versus non-ionic. And there are some truisms and generalizations that we can get away with making. In general, macrocyclic agents tend to leave less in the body than do the linear agents. But within the macrocyclic agents and within the linear agents, there seem to be significant differences on those agents themselves, how much they leave. Is it the macrocyclic that's the ionic? Macrocyclics can be ionic or non-ionic. Okay. Linear agents can be ionic or non-ionic. Okay. Mm -hmm. Ionic, opposite bonds attract. Ionic seems to be a tighter bond. Macrocyclic seems to be a much tighter bond. Linear is a weaker bond than macrocyclic. Non-ionic is a weaker bond than ionic. So the stronger the bond, the, 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 the theory... So non-ionic, linear would be the weakest. Exactly. Non-ionic, linear are optimark and omniscan. That's correct. So having said that, before residual gadolinium was a topic... When it came to nephrogenic systemic fibrosis, NSF, what they theorized was the transmetallation or dechelation theory. And the theory there was that the gadolinium, we know that gadolinium is toxic. Gadolinium is a heavy metal. It's in the lanthanide series. It's an, it's an element. Oxygen, nitrogen, right. potassium, it's an element. But nobody's administering heavy metals to humans. Right. I like to tell my patients that heavy metal in any form is toxic to humanity. I agree. <laughs> so what we do is we take the same gadolinium ion and we tie it up in medical speak. The suture is ligated. That means you tied it up. So we take a ligand molecule to tie up the gadolinium. And you attach those together in what's referred to as a chelated complex. Chelate, I think it's Greek, and I think it means claw. In any case, so there's a chelated complex of this gadolinium ion and the ligand molecule. And all these different agents out there, all the different competing brands, gadolinium is gadolinium is gadolinium, right? It's, it's just an element. So the gadolinium is identical in all of these agents. What differs and what makes this drug X and this is drug Y and this is competing drug Z is the ligand molecule. If this is caldiamide, then gal gadolinium with caldiamide becomes omniscan. If this is DTPA, gadolinium and DTPA, we call that magnavist. Do you understand? So it's just the difference in the ligand molecule. So the theory of NSF, nephrogenic systemic fibrosis, was that these different agents, the affinity for the ligand molecule, the tightness of that bond, if you will, differed from agent to agent. And as a result of that, if they were to dissociate it's very, very, very uncommon. It's a very small amount. But like any chemical reaction, it is in equilibrium. And some will stay, the vast majority for every one of these stays bound. But some in equilibrium will be bouncing off. And if it does get released, gadolinium is exquisitely reactive. And it'll find something to attach to. Maybe a phosphate, a carbonate. It'll find something. And the theory of transmetallation or dechelation is that if it does separate, then this gadolinium will find a phosphate or other molecule, and the two of them will waltz off to wherever phosphate lives, maybe bone, and stay there for years in a reservoir that's just hidden inside bone where it was never meant to go in the first place. It was never designed to biodistribute to bone. It was designed as an extracellular fluid agent. As long as it was attached to its initial ligand, it would be extracellular fluid, the kidneys would then filter it and glomerular filtration out into the urine. But if it's going to get attached to, for example, a phosphate and then find its way into a bone reservoir, it might stay there for months and years and not make it into the kidneys and not get excreted. So who is more likely to have it dissociate and have that happen? 
someone in whom you inject it, and then it stays in the body for longer than it was initially designed. Well, why would it stay in the body for longer? Kidney failure. Since the drugs all are these ages that we're discussing for neuroradiologic application were excreted by the kidneys. If the kidneys are not working well, that means that they are still get excreted, but more slowly. So they hang around on the dance floor that is the human being longer. And eventually they may split partners. They may just, if they're there, the longer you wait, the greater the chance for dissociation. With perfectly normal kidneys, we felt, you give the drug, you do the imaging, the kidneys filter them, it's literally in the toilet, you should excuse me, uh, shortly thereafter. And even if it dissociates, who cares? It's now out of the human. Conceptually, the normal kidney patient should not have to worry about it. And the theory was that if you have bad kidneys, especially if they're very poorly functioning kidneys, it sticks around for so long that some of them that dissociate and maybe more permanently in a sense will stick around in that human body, perhaps in bone, and lead to inflammatory reactions that would eventually lead to what you and I refer to as NSF. And that was a theory of transmetallation, dechelation, dissociation. They all mean the same thing. 